In the prior video, we showed six assumptions we are going to need if we want to derive confidence intervals for beta 0 and beta 1. To derive these confidence intervals, we follow a process, like we did in the prior module, where we first create a z-value for b0 and b1 respectively. Then we will unpack that z-value into a confidence interval. The only problem that we face is that we need a denominator value here for the z-value. What is a suitable standard deviation for beta 0 and beta 1 respectively? The derivation for the variance of beta 1 is fairly straightforward. It builds on a number of expectation and variance formula properties we had seen in a prior video, as well as a clever rearrangement of the equation that calculates the B1 slope coefficient estimate. Once you sub in the formula for the variance estimates, we can derive this equation shown here on the screen. Even though this looks complicated and messy, I only want to emphasize the interpretation of it though. This formula says that the variance of the estimate of B1 is related to two important properties, the numerator and the denominator. The numerator is the standard error that we've seen before and defined from this formula. The interpretation of this is fairly intuitive. It says that if our standard error is small, the variance of the slope estimate is small as well. Remember, we would like the variance of our slope estimates to be small. Practically speaking, that implies that if we sample from another set of data and recalculate the slope, we will get a slope value close to the true slope value. A large variance estimate for the slope is undesirable. It says that if we recalculated the slope, we would get very different numbers every time. So as you can see, small variances for the slope B1 are desirable, and a small standard error is one way to ensure that that variance is small. Now the denominator term illustrates for us that provided we sample x values that are far away from the mean, those xj's are far away from x bar, then we get a large denominator, which implies a small variance of b1 as well. Practically speaking, that implies we should make sure our data are sampled over a wide range of x. Spanning a large x range means that the slope can be estimated with greater accuracy. Estimating over a small range, as shown over here, illustrates that the slope can take on any number of values and therefore leads to a higher variance. So that summarizes the variance for B1. Let's look at the formula for the variance of B0. You'll recall the formula for B0 relies on the value of B1. The variability in B1 actually propagates over into B0. That's why most of the formula here for B0's variance looks very similar to the B1 variance term. But there's an additional part up front here, the 1 over n term inside the bracket. And that indicates to us that we should take a large number of data points in order to reduce the variance. That again makes intuitive sense. You would not use a small number of data points and expect a great least squares model. The more data points you take, the more stable or the less variable your least squares model will be. So here is an equation summary for the variances of B0, B1, as well as the variance of the errors. That last term is just what we've called the standard error squared. Rather than call these variances, I'm going to use the notation standard error squared for B0 and B1, as is commonly done in statistical textbooks. Once we know these standard errors, or loosely speaking, the standard deviation of the B0 values and B1 values, we can go calculate confidence intervals for them. Confidence intervals are found by putting a z value between lower and upper critical values. And we have all the pieces in place now to go calculate that z value, the numerator and the denominator. Because we have estimated the standard deviation, that standard error down here in the denominator, these values of z are actually t-distributed, so we should go use critical values from the t-distribution. Well, how many degrees of freedom should we use? We have n data points, and we have used up two degrees of freedom to estimate the model slope and intercept, so therefore we have n minus k, or n minus two degrees of freedom. I will unpack both of these confidence intervals now and show the lower bound and the upper bound. The final form of the equation is then shown here on the screen, the confidence interval for beta zero and beta one respectively. Now it's time for an example to use these equations. I'd like you to use these calculated values of B0, B1, and the standard errors. Pause the video 
and plug in these values to calculate the lower bound and upper bound for the two confidence intervals. Do your values agree with mine, shown here on the screen, particularly the values shown in red? The critical value of t is 2.26 at the 95% level, and there are 11 minus 2 or 9 degrees of freedom. It is important to interpret what that confidence interval for beta 0 and beta 1 is. Let's take a look at the case for beta 1 first. You will recall that confidence intervals give us a probable range within which we expect to find the true value of the parameter. Here I've illustrated the least squares fit line in red. We will never know our true slope value, but we do know that the bound between 0.23 and between 0.77 over here are probable ranges for that slope. When the slope is equal to the lowest point in the bound, 0.23, that's the slightly dashed line over here. When the slope is as high as 0.77, we get this other dashed line. So there's a range of potential values for the true slope coefficient. Notice, of course, though, that when the slope coefficient varies between that lower bound and upper bound, the intercept is also changing. You cannot really interpret the confidence interval of beta 0 without interpreting the confidence interval of beta 1. Remember, Right at the start of this section, we had said that the estimates for B0 and B1 are correlated with each other, and the confidence intervals, in the same way, cannot be interpreted independently of each other. The confidence interval for beta 0 follows in exactly the same way, and gives us bounds for the probable value of the intercept. Let's look at one more example, and in this case, we're looking at data that shows the number of traffic cameras here on the x-axis and the number of road deaths per 10,000 kilometers of road network on the y-axis. Is there a cause and effect in this plot? I'll let you pause the video and reflect on that question. Let's take a look, though, at the regression model for this data. I've done the work here for you and calculated the least squares model as the number of deaths, y, equal to 15.7 minus 0.7 times the number of cameras. At face value, that slope coefficient of 0.7 tells us that every single additional camera will serve to reduce road deaths by 0.7 per every 10,000 kilometers of road network. This is a number that would be important to someone working in public policy and road safety. But let's take a further look at the regression model and in particular the confidence intervals. For beta 0, the intercept, that confidence interval is a value between 9.61 and 21.8. It is a significant confidence interval since it does not span zero. The interpretation is that when there are no traffic cameras, we have bounds here between 9.61 and 21.8, which are probable bounds for the population parameter beta zero. The slope coefficient is a little more interesting. The confidence interval for this parameter does span zero, indicating there's a strong likelihood of no significant effect due to the number of cameras. In fact, there is a very likely regression line shown here on the screen that could have been drawn through these data to illustrate that cameras have no significant effect on mitigating deaths on the road network. The fact that this confidence interval though is asymmetric and skewed to the negative indicates there is a small likelihood that having non-zero cameras will help to reduce the number of deaths on the roads. There are some other interesting questions we can also ask of this scatter plot. Why is Israel up here? Why does it have such a high number of deaths on its roads despite a large number of traffic cameras? Take a look at Canada's location here. Very few cameras and very few deaths. What are Canada, Sweden, Australia and the United States doing that is very effective compared to countries such as Britain and the Netherlands? Similar number of deaths yet very different number of cameras. Also, what is different between those points down here and China, Croatia, Serbia, Russia, and the Ukraine up here? Large number of deaths, but same number of traffic cameras. All of these are the thoughts that you should have in your mind when plotting and visualizing data, and especially when investigating a least squares model. Lastly, let's take a look at the standard error value of 10.9. It gives you an idea of the degree of error in our predictions from the model. Let's say you predicted a value of 20 deaths on the y-axis. The standard error of about 11 units over here emphasizes the high degree of prediction error associated with this model. 
recall that most prediction errors lie within a bound of plus or minus two times the standard error. Plus or minus two times the standard error spans a range of 44 units, but our Y range is about 45 units over here in the plot. So we are producing as much error in our model as there is in the original range of the Y data, confirming once again that this model is fairly poor. And the R squared value confirms that conclusion as well. And you're very comfortable interpreting that number already, but it's good to see it here in this context. Let's take a look at one final example. This is data that is used to predict the temperature from a thermocouple. The thermocouple measures a voltage, and that voltage is then used to predict the temperature. Most thermocouples are accurate to plus or minus half a degree, even on cheap thermocouples. So when we build this model, the R squared value is 99.6%, extremely high. You'd be very happy with an R squared value that high in any lab reports or experimental work that you've done up to this point in your career. But when we go look at the standard error, 3.9 Kelvin, should we be satisfied with this model's prediction ability? Probably not. The prediction error, when we're trying to use this model for the intended purpose of predicting temperature, shows that our temperature predictions of plus or minus two standard errors, that's a range of about 16 Kelvin, would be extremely poor, especially when we go compare it to cheap off-the-shelf thermocouples. Now this model's prediction ability is not that great, but in practice, we can improve it. How do you think we might do so? I'd like you to think along the lines of taking multiple readings, predicting from that input value multiple times, and then averaging the output. What does the central limit theorem tell us will happen? I'll leave you with that thought in your mind.